Hello, hi. Um, I'm Xinyuan, director of Jetlag. Um, it's a very personal film that I'm trying to share with you, and uh, hope you will enjoy the 111 minutes with us um, from this, uh, yeah, this journey. Hi, welcome to the Teddy TV. My name is Jean Bourbobak, and this time we are discussing the film Jet Lag. Hi, welcome to the Teddy Award. Welcome to the Berlinale. We are very happy to have you here and have the opportunity to talk about the film. Uh, let's start with, with your inspiration. What inspired you to, to tell this story? Um, hi, uh, and thank you for having me. Um, so as for inspiration, it's like, um, it's a very personal documentary. Mm -hmm. So um, it started from a family journey that I took with my family from China to Myanmar. Uh, in looking for my great-grandfather. Uh, great and uh, so that's, I guess, the starting point of the whole yeah. thing. Right. But then at the end, you are also crossing many different lands, many different times. Can you talk about a bit about this process? Sure. Um, so uh, as I have mentioned, the whole film started as an inquiry into my uh, family's like mystery in the past. But then when I dive into the project, it's getting more and more like a long swim, in, swim into the memory. Yeah. And uh, uh, so how should I put it? Um, and then later at the beginning of 2020, I was uh, trapped in Austria because of the pandemic. Mm. So um, I also start to experience the same thing as my great grandfather in Myanmar that being in a foreign land for a really long time. So when that started to click, I think the parallel storyline started to merge together. One On one side, it's um, my personal uh, experience of um, being in a foreign country. And the other side is um, about half a century ago, my great grandfather was in Myanmar um, looking for new opportunities in life. So um, when these two lines start to merge together, um, I think the theme of the film started to develop into uh, something about diaspora, about intimacy, about what it really means to um, have a family. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Like that seemed to be at the at the center of the film. This question: what it means to be a family, to be part of a family, uh, with all of its turbulences and complications and beauties and wonders. Um, I wonder about how did you. Um, how did you work with your family? Because this is a very intimate film. You really go into depth in, into your, your family history. And obviously it, it affects many, many people uh, within your family. How was it to, to navigate that? Mm -hmm. um, so I think naturally I guess started by observing the others and try to get to know them. And uh, because I've been away from home for a long time, so it is also a process for me to uh, reestablish who I am in the family and then try to get to know them better. Mm -hmm. And there is a new dy dynamic created by these kind of um, new encounter in a way. Yeah. Um, so I think it is hard for people who are not in the film industry to really understand what is uh, what it means to be exposed um, through cinema. So I try to be open with them about uh, the process and where we're going with the film. And uh, at the same time, um, I think with my partner, she's also um, encouraging me to rethink about my own presence in the film. So um, after I think I captured 
um, something very um, sincere, but also like really intimate about them. I think it's unavoidable that I have to um, put myself in there as well. So I think the harder process is to um, coming from behind the camera to be in front of the camera and mm. what uh, when did that happen and how do I handle that? Um, yeah, so it's really um, a process from me approaching the others and then getting myself in and yeah. uh, discover something altogether. Yeah. And eventually. how was this actual process of you all of a sudden finding yourself on the other side of the camera? Um, because I also acted in one of my short films, um, like um, when I was uh, studying in the US, okay. um, it's also a, a queer film, like the short. So I think it's not something so unfamiliar to me. But at the same time, um, I think being watched or being aware that what you say and done will be recorded. Um, I think it's a good study process because I also mm. need to go through editing and uh, look at it too. I think it's um, a very healthy um, process for me to uh, go through it and uh, then work it till the end. So it's not only like me present myself in front of the camera, but also um, digest it through editing mm. and uh, um, to exam what it really means. Um, and uh, I don't think it's something that's so easy to put into words but I think um, it creates some, it's not like something more equal, it's something more mutual, I think, mm -hmm. um, for uh, the people who are involved in the project. Yeah. The film had a very um, beautiful black and white um, materiality to it. It was, it was very um, textures and, and, and warmth was really coming out uh, within the grains of this film. Can you talk a bit about the technical aspects of, of the movie? Sure. sure. Um, the film was shot on, um, I think, very portable equipment, like iPhone, DV, and uh, Osmo, like the small sport, sport camera. Um, so I think by using these kind of very um, handy equipment, I get to start whenever I want and uh, um, go through just because people are very used to iPhones and people are used to small equipment. So um, I think when we get to certain intimate moment, it won't be uh, a huge equipment like standing in front of us. Uh, it's more like um, more like a game that we play in our daily life. Um, and then these portable equipment also brings it's the other side is like the um, pixels are not so crisp, like uh, the image is a bit more grainy than, uh, let's say, like more advanced camera. But at the same time, it has certain textures that is more hand handmade and it's similar to um, the archival footage in the film. And uh, from time to time, we're going from more grainy ones to more crisp ones. And uh, we're also um, taking these kind of um, disadvantage of the image quality into our use. So in a certain part of the film, we're exaggerating on the grain grainness to create certain experience for the viewer, not mm -hmm. only on the content wise, but yeah. on more a feeling and uh, for their uh, experience. Yeah. Yeah. That, so it's yeah. not. Yeah. Not only serving for the storyline. Yeah. In that way, it was very evocative. Um, the film. Um, I was also wondering about. Um, you mentioned that there is. It's practically like a, a memory process as well. Doing this this film, um, and I was intrigued by this connection of the medium of film, and the working of memory. Um, I don't know what is your take on that and what sort of considerations did you have um, as you were working on this subject? Mm -hmm. um, so memory is uh, a really important subject in this film and um, because it all started with this haunting feeling um, brought by my uh, grandma's memory towards her father. 
um, which uh, like who left when she was only five. So all she had with her father was memories. And uh, partially to me, that memory also um, contains certain fantasy, certain imagination that she had towards her father. And um, the film itself, many times it can be very manipulative, same as how um, memory works on on the person. Yeah. So I try to be very conscious on how a film take on the memory because I think I had a chance to tell the story about how a daughter missed her father for a lifelong time and how touching will be. But at the same time, um, I'm also wondering like, um, is that just an excuse that she made for herself to believe that mm. there was someone who cared for her as much as she cared for um, him? Right. Um, but after I finished the film, I also rethink about if you have the courage to dive into a relationship, to dive into something that you want to believe in, isn't that more more brave or mm. um what will that bring you like better feelings in life instead of like just to stay conscious and think about um, what is real or not? So, so I'm I'm not trying to um, put a conclusion here, but I think it's a process that we kind of have to go through when we, um, yeah, try to live our lives. Yeah, and it certainly has interesting twists and turns when when we when we do that um, in life. Um, it was very interesting to see, I mean, it's the, like, soon the third year of the pandemic. It was very yeah. interesting yeah. to see um, footage about it that I think captured very very well this, especially this initial part of, of isolation and closeness and yeah being in very confined spaces with with uh, with the people that we that we feel like belonging with um can you can you tell us a bit about this this process how as the pandemic was happening it it sneaked into the film mm -hmm. um i think definitely the pandemic kind of put us all in a small bubble and uh when me and my partner was stuck in Austria, I think we definitely went through the whole phrase of anxiety and uh, uh, started to feel the uncertainty. And especially um, before we went to Europe, we were in China and that's like even at the very beginning of the pandemic. And it's like the COVID is chasing after us all, all the way through to Europe. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and we were um, ha we have to face this uncertainty all together. And uh, I think she used to say that during that time, it's like we were trapped in a high pressure pot and mm. many things are um, more explosive and many details are magnified. Um, but at the same time, I think it is a chance for us to face um, our relationships and uh, to look closely at what is... Um, what is happening between us. And uh, after we come back to China, we have some friends that we uh, live together in Beijing. And uh, uh, during that time, in order to get, I, I think like more thorough information about pandemic and about um, the world, yeah. they're also trying hard to learn English. So that comes the scene that people are learning English together, even though that's put into a place that is not so much in a realistic setup in the film. But um, during that time, we do have an English study group yeah. and uh, people start to, um, because we are in this bubble, I think it's easier for people to open up and uh, um, like come down to who we are. And we have the leisure, have the time to um, examine it together and uh, share things that we don't usually share normally. Because without the pandemic, we're busy at work, we're like traveling around. So um, the pandemic, in a way, set a stage for all of us to uh, meditate and uh, to use another language to express ourselves. So, um, but still, like, it feels m much more like a dream because mm -hmm. it's not our, like, life experience in the past, like, 20, 30 years. Um right. So it's 
something new, something essential, something surrounded by anxiety and alienation. But um, as far as I think people are safe, I think it's uh, instead of like complaining, I think it's good to um, get as much information as you can and uh, really, I don't know, um, try to make use of the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was interesting because now we talked about a bit about language as well. There were many different languages uh, in this film. And then, of course, there is the film language on, on top of all of this. How did you navigate this? And because I had sometimes the feel that that the film language also kind of follows the different languages, their rhythm, their um, their melodies, like it somehow it had a sensible feel on the film language as well, how that interacted with these languages. Can you explain a bit about this? Mm -hmm, sure. Um, I think um, so many times I think for um, narrative films or even some uh, documentaries, people started with uh, text, like start from writing yeah. and then start to organize image. Some people's inspirations may come from images or certain characters, mm -hmm. certain locations. Um, but I think with this film, um, I think it's, it's more like an experiment. It's more like an action. It's like me with the camera um, interfere with life. Um, so it, it's like me, like many years ago when people talk about experimental films, it's like the, the camera is part of your hand, part of your organ, mm. part of your eyes. Um, and uh, you are aware that you're carrying this equipment and uh, you're getting into your life. Um, and see what your action stirs upon the pond of life and see what that happens to you. So um, it's it started from an action instead of uh, a scripted plot or something that I try to achieve. Um, so in the process, I also have to face the, um, the process with um, that's that's not so uh, so much effective as you expected. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's I don't I don't know. Um, so eventually, it's turned out to be an essay. It's more like a writing. It's like something you analyze mm -hmm. later. And uh, um, I don't usually have an attempt at the very beginning when I make a film and uh, <clears throat> have certain story that I want to convey. Um, but I think um, filmmaking is part of the lifestyle that I'm taking with this film. Yeah. And so people around me kind of have to get used to it um, with that camera popping up mm -hmm. sometimes and always. Um, so it can be difficult at certain times, but I think it's also like really valuable to um, keep that kind of material um, for right now. Um, and so maybe later we can like look at it and see like how um, with the camera eye flow through the things that you watch many years later. So it's not something that I think I uh, plan out or uh, try to draw a certain mm -hmm. shape. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about queer intimacy, which is also mm -hmm. very prominently present in the film and it's very nicely intertwines with uh, with the uh, with the family history and and with the with the other topics um, tackled in this film what was your approach to this you mean intimacy like queer intimacy in particular yeah. oh queer intimacy yeah um so i think at the beginning i didn't put this as a, a label for my film mm -hmm. because i think it's a queer life is supposed to be something that we can share and understand and get to know more about, even though I think it's still like a pretty touchy and controversial subject in China. Um, I try to face it with um, a normal glance. And uh, I think me and my partner are both think that gender is fluid and you have the freedom to explore it through time and through your own experience. So um, I think it's, it's part of the daily mundane at, um, and it's part of 
our personal experience, part of the something that we are trying to communicate, not only with our family, but also with the audience. Um, and uh, I think that's the queer part that we put into the film. Um, and uh, I think I try to uh, express it and present it um, as something essential in our lives. And also something that um, as, as mundane and as beautiful as breathing and uh, as our daily lives. And uh, for the intimacy part, um, I think it's um, in a more individual level. I think um, because our family background, I think each of us in the film kind of have our different um, intimate is issues. Yeah. And we are trying to uh, look closely at it through our relationship and through the filming process. Um, and because we are very aware of the camera. So um, I think it's also a gesture to... Um, to present the intimacy and then analyze it and uh, try to experience it together. And also like to create an experience on camera as well. So we're not only documenting queer life. I think we're trying to um, express our individual experience on the queer life. Yeah, right. Um, for me, queerness also related in the film um to time how time sort of collapses in this normative sense as we usually think about as progressive and running in a straight linear uh, trajectory um because time is complicated in this film like the film complicates this notion um can you explain a bit about this connection between queerness and time mm -hmm. in the film Mm -hmm. um, so, um, as I said at the beginning of the interview, the film feels like a long swim into the mirror. So if, let's say, the underwater world is the, the past and uh, the above water part is the air, and uh, during the swim you constantly dive into the memory about the past, about who you are, about what you believe in, um, about your own family background and then sometimes we dip up and like we catch a breath in the present tense and uh, with me and my partner um, and also because in the film the reason why my partner um, is in the film is also because she has a very strong connection with her grandma so um, there's also a, a theme about um, feminism about um our own shared past memories about um, three of us. We all have um, certain um, certain conflicts, certain confusions, certain haunting questions towards um, the the father figure about that power in a family, yeah. and uh, what that really means to um, be in a family that um, have a missing father and uh, what you choose in life to spend time with um, another female. And so, so I think within this circle of grandma, me and my, um, my girlfriend, we have something in common that we're trying to discuss together. So um, the film is diving through me and my grandma and then me and my partner and then my partner and grandma. So that comes into a full circle. Um, I think that's how the, uh, our career life part combined with the, the family, um, mm. mystery part. Yeah. Yeah. It was really beautiful to see these, these, um, connections and, and female, uh, very powerful, like female connections in the film with your partner, um, with other female family members. Um, and yeah, as you say, like there is this mystery about about this missing father figure, but then at the same time, um, this whole discussion takes place through these very strong female connections and companionships. Um, can you um, explain a bit about um, about filming these very 
intricate and intimate but very powerful connections between all these different women in the film. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's kind of like natural to me in a way because in my mom's family, uh, my grandma have like three daughters. So oh, okay. um, usually within the family, my grandpa was the only man and many times we were just chit chat and uh, say things, comments on men on mm -hmm. like dinner table yeah. and uh, just will suddenly realize that, oh, my grandpa is still here and uh, he's a man and he can listen to it. Um, so I think that happens very naturally. It's, it's not even saying like, oh, girls, like get together and uh, let's um, like talk about these issues. It's, it's more like a family dynamic to me um, for um, girls to um, talk about talk about our confusions to talk about uh what's stuck there in our relationships and to try to say uh, to solve problems and uh, to have our voice heard um yeah so it's like a family tradition in a way <laughs> yeah lovely um the film is titled jet lag and i mm -hmm. thought it was a very like a very um cheeky um way of kind of describing this whole state in which the film moves and what this film encompasses. Like there is this feeling of being in between and and being a bit out of center, um, this, this flowy uh, nature of the whole thing. Can you talk a bit about how, how you came to title the, the film Jet Lag? Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, so because the family trip took place really early on in 2013 and it is uh, it isn't until that me and my partner was stuck in Austria that it, we really started to rework on the material and eventually made the film. So um, at the very beginning when I started on the family side, it it, it has an old title. Um, that is different. And I think it is through our own experience of um, having trouble buying tickets and uh, having to uh, relocate ourselves uh, from the quarantine through the, um, like the, the mandatory quarantine after we come back to China and then uh, traveling without like uh, traveling in China and uh, visiting our friends and visiting our family. Uh, so that relocation and the whole ex traveling experience and constantly looking at the material that is already in the past that started to catch up with the present tense um, that we came up with the, um, the, the title jet lag. Um, so that kind of constantly moving experience because the whole, the whole post-production was done in China with the pandemic still going on. So all that experience before were now contained in this bubble and start mm. to um, digest itself and start to, um, we started to play around it on the, the timeline. So when we eventually settled in one place and re-experience the whole thing, it's really like have, have that feeling of jet lagged um, and, uh, but at the same time, I think the title also allow the audience to have certain space to be uh, lost in time. And uh, because in black and white, it's, it's harder to, um, it's harder to um, put yourself in spot of where you are in a story. So yeah. I think the, the audience can also just relax and uh, look at getting into each scene and slowly realize where you are. Um, and uh, there's no big problem with jet lag because eventually um, at certain moment, you will be more certain of where you are. And, uh, but that experience also, I think that experience also have some certain loneliness to it because it's mm. not so easy to be explained and shared. Um, so that also comes to uh, this um, private and personal experience that we are trying to uh, share with the yeah. audience. Yeah, lovely. I like, I really like this connection with the audience experience and 
and the jet lag it it really yeah it's it's very fitting great thank you very much for for your time thank and you. for your insights and i wish you all the best for the for the upcoming berlinale yeah thank you so much and all the best with berlinale this year it's exciting to have it like physically happening <laughs>